How did woke ideologues hijack a century of American education? So in World War I, all of the men went off to fight the war, and all the women were staffing the factories to make the weapons of war. And so now you have all these kids at home, and what do you do with them? Well, you have to put them somewhere. Look at all these fancy public schools we've just started to experiment with. And the public schools got off the ground, not because they provided an educational service, but because they provided a daycare service. So you guys have probably heard the communist term, the long march through the institutions, right? right? Okay, so that was a term coined by a guy named Rudy Deutschke in 1966 a communist. His idea was we're going to take our ideology and march through the institutions to change society downstream from the institutions. The long march through the institutions isn't just bring your people in. It's when you get your people in and start to squeeze everybody else out. You need to get educated. You need to know what's really going on in the schools, how it actually works, and why it's happening. You've got to actually know what's happening. You can't just go be, I'm a good person and I want to help. It's not enough. You've got to get educated. And then when you go in, depending on where you are, like if you're in Florida, you can probably do a lot of good now. If you're in Massachusetts, you've got a different fight. It's not a harder fight, it's a different fight. How are we doing, everybody? Welcome in to the Sons of Liberty studio. We have moved the studio to a beautiful little outdoor terrace here. Hunter and I, we have got a special guest, Dr. James Lindsay. Dr. James Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for bringing me up to the Cape Cod. Yeah, yeah, beautiful area, and we're happy to have you. We're having him, hosting him for a Turning Point USA event tonight, actually, Academia Under Attack. Yep. And it's all about how woke ideologues hijacked a century of American education. So I figured we'd uh, those who won't be able to be at the event tonight, they can kind of get the lowdown right here. Yeah. And we'll start by chat by going through that. So. Um, how did woke ideologues hijack a century of American education? I know there's like, there's a century, so there's a lot of time span within yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> it turns out that's a, like, it, all right, we're Do you want like a, do you want like a, yeah, right. whether so it's like a history lesson or... Um, no, and it kind of is like that. So 1917 is an important year. I'm not going to dwell on that with education, but I am going to point out that it was, this was very fast. I yeah. think, so 1917 is when Lenin and Trotsky went to Soviet Union. Um, and they initiated and completed the Bolshevik Revolution, or the, the initial phase of the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution, and established the Bolshevik government. In other words, the Soviet Union was formed. It took them a few more years to finish the revolution through the country, but it was 1917 in October uh, that it's called the October Revolution that this really happened. So it also turns out that in 1917 in the great state of Minnesota is when the Communist Party USA started. And so 1917, I'm just kind of bookmarking 1917 because um, by 1919, there were actually already significant bids by the communists in the United States to try to take advantage of the brand new thing that we had called public education. And public education is, was not something Americans were really fond of. We liked the idea of public universities, actually. Um, you know, that goes back to Thomas Jefferson. So people will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Thomas Jefferson, University of Virginia. And he did want an educated populace. But they cooked up these public schools. Actually, that was a socialist program itself. Um, what was his name? Robert Owen or Owens? Something like this. I'd have to look that up. In the 1840s, came up with this. He had a socialist commune or whatever and he was going to have i think in indiana or something like that and he was going to have maybe that's wrong but somewhere and he was going to have this um you know utopia little commune and they had an education model and he went just nuts about it and it turns out going to the prussian government of all places ends up getting a hold of this i forget the story of how that happened and the prussians loved it so this becomes called the prussian model of education they adopted the whole thing the prussian leader loved the idea because the idea was that you would use education to build out the people that you need to staff your ideal society and so he's like oh well we can make perfect workers basically we can make little you know civic drones and then the higher level of education we can make our political class and we can use education to mold the future into the you know new society and so it's got set up as the Prussian model. When we all sit in desks and rows and face the front of the classroom and so on, that's the Prussian model. Mm. Um, not to say that that's necessarily a bad way to organize a classroom and, and to manage that circumstance, but this got adopted and the Americans weren't having it. And the Americans were not interested in mm. doing this. Um, and along come, you know, characters like Horace Mann and John Dewey, well, Horace Mann first and then John Dewey later. But what happened really was World War I. And this is actually super important because your question is how did they hijack American education over a century? And World War I, which is 1914 to 1918, the U.S. getting involved near the end, so 1917 becomes sort of relevant again. The answer turns out to be daycare. 
So in World War One, all of the men went off to fight the war eventually. All the American men in by 16 and 17 were leaving to Europe to go fight. And all the women were staffing the factories to make the war, uh, weapons of war and the, you know, other necessities of life. And so now you have all these kids at home, and what do you do with them? Well, you have to put them somewhere. Look at all these fancy public schools we've just started to experiment with. Mm. And the public schools got off the ground not because they provided an educational service, but because they provided a daycare service. And if you ask a lot of parents today why they're so committed to sending their kids to school, they say, well, how are we going to work if we don't send our kids to school, yeah. a.k.a. daycare? For the day. So public school has this weird daycare function all along. It was actually right. a socialist idea in the first place that ran its course through the, the Prussian government and then was brought back over here and the, was trying to solve the question of daycare. So the communists hijacked education by hijacking something that parents realized that they needed, which was effectively child care. Mm. Uh, in order to participate in our economy as it modernized, they needed child care. And so they saw their inroad there and took advantage of that because you now have, as my friend Alex Newman phrases it, and this is really his analysis that I'm quoting from, but he phrases it that for the first time in the world we had uh, education by the government for the government rather than by the people and for the people. So before the the World War One was education on more of like a town level? Yeah, that and individual. I mean, it was like private tutors for the most part. It was so homeschooling wasn't homeschool. like a sect. It was kind of every. Well, it turns Everyone out homeschooling fell off hard after the public schools took off, right? right? And of course, always the wealthy and the more, you know, privileged members of society were sending their kids to nice private schools and boarding schools and so on. That's always been the case. But... Um, it fell off uh, with public schooling. Homeschooling did. And it didn't really resurge until about 30, 35 years ago. It was in the 80s and 90s. And we had a couple of Supreme Court cases, and then it started to blow up. But it was only kind of like relig hardcore religious communities that were homeschooling their kids because they wanted to keep them out of the secular education world and to use their, their opportunity to raise their children and educate their children as, um, you know, in a values education system that matched their religious beliefs. And now, of course, that's blossomed. It's actually going through an enormous growth spurt right now. There's more resources than ever. But that was the answer, is that they, they seized the, there was an opportunity, which is all these kids are in government schools now for the first time, and communists love to use government in order to seize the means of production, in this case of the child and therefore of the future. And so they started trying to figure out how to orchestrate education around socialist ideals and son your two big kind of characters at that time oh well, really it's horace mann and, and john dewey there's a couple of others lev vygotsky there's another guy his name i always forget and i have to go back and think of who he is again so were that, they thinking generations in the future was this john like dewey a was. long plan well john dewey definitely thought that that public education should be to create a socialist society right. he traveled the soviet union in the either late teens or early 20s thought it was fantastic came back and wrote about how fantastic it is how great their schooling system is and he actually organized his entire program of education around um installing and instilling socialist values so and john dewey was kind of they were called the social reformers of education they were john dewey was like the education guy for the first half of the 20th century he was like the guy now of course this is also happening during woodrow wilson's progressive era so the progressive movements at its peak it has the power of the presidency there's a lot going on there that I'm just going to glaze over and kind of ignore, uh, because my expertise isn't in the first half of the 20th century part. But you said, how did they do it over a century? Well, we had this new phenomenon of public schools that were under government control. And so you could have these progressives like John Dewey, heavily funded by people like the Rockefellers, heavily funded by the Rockefellers, enthralled with the Soviet Union, working for the, you know, the Wilson administration's uh, downstream concerns about education. And creating a socialist bent but americans weren't really keen on socialism there was a socialist movement you know everybody kind of is aware that late 19th century early 20th century it was kind of a hot topic for the american left but by the 30s and 40s it really was losing steam and by the 50s it was anathema mm. because we were in the cold war and uh you know the dirty commies in the in russia <laughs> right. or soviet union were the enemy and yeah. so we weren't going to have dirty commie socialism in our schools like the russians 
what well, we kind of did, but kind of didn't. It, it what hadn't really taken, right? So some of the educational theory and practice was informed by these visionaries, like Lev Vygotsky, I mentioned's idea of uh, what he called the zone of proximal development, which built out into what they call scaffolding now. There's lots of academic terms for what they do. This is actually a way for them to essentially organize brainwashing. Interesting. Uh, and so, I mean, it's not the only thing it can be used for. It can be used for legitimate educational purposes too, but this is how it works. But everything changed in the 60s. And this is really where my expertise kicks in. So the first half of the last century, there are other people. I point people to Alex Newman a lot, for example, uh, to go look into that, who know a lot about it. Um, Jake Kleisick, or does he just go by Jake? John Kleisick, I think is, his, is how he writes it when he's publishing, is um, he's written a book called School World Order, very informative on this. You can go check out Charlotte Isserbeet, who died some years ago. She was in Reagan's administration in the 80s. She exposed a lot of this, has some very good books about it, uh, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America or something like that, um, if I remember the title right. So there, that side of the story is told by other people better than I can. I've really spent a lot of time unlocking from roughly the late 1960s forward. Okay. Um, so in 68, in Portuguese, little known to the West, or the North, I should say, really, because it's South America, little known to the North, uh, to the United States and Canada was a Brazilian guy named Paulo Freire. Okay, so Paulo Freire was a communist, a liberation theologian, deep Marxist theorist. Also, though, he was in this kind of what they call liberation or third worldism movement that was going to throw off colonization. So he was mad about the Portuguese colonization of um, of Brazil, and he was in Recife, and he, you know, in Brazil. And he came up with this method of education. At the time, he had a left-leaning government in the early 1960s that loved it, put his program of, of miseducation into action, and um, it kind of started to ruin Brazil. In 60, a little later, four or five, something like this, you had a conservative government take over in, in uh, Brazil, and they chased him out. They exiled him. He went to Bolivia. He got kicked out of Bolivia, too. He went to Chile, and he studied with... Um, a handful of priests who were liberation theologians, in other words, communists posing as Catholics. And in 1968, he writes this book in Portuguese called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is his kind of magnum opus. He has another book he published in, or he wrote in Portuguese in 67, but he didn't publish The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Pedagogy of the Oppressed becomes the book that is the model, and I'll come back to what Freire's model is in a moment, that allows him to steal education in the West. Um, but it gets published in English before it gets published in Portuguese, so it has to get translated, and that happened in 1970. And immediately, Harvard took interest. Harvard somehow knew about this guy before his big burst onto the scene because they invited him in 68 to do a, a two-year lecture appointment. And he also got invited to work at the World Council of Churches, which was a Soviet creation to create an interfaith movement to inter, inter, uh what am I looking for, infiltrate churches uh, of all different faiths. And so he gets this double invite, you know, mm -hmm. come teach at Harvard for two years or come work at the World Council of Churches in, in Geneva for, for 10 years. And so he tried to take both. So he taught at Harvard for six months in 68 going to 69. Then he left for Geneva, spent the entirety of the 1970s in Geneva, traveling back and forth to New York and Boston to liaise with people at Harvard or at Columbia or in other places, um, kind of on the American education scene. So this is how he gets kind of some institutional cred, right? Well, it turns out he didn't get that much, not yet. Uh, and of course, Harvard is behind this in, in some measure, right? But uh, how far it has fallen. Yeah. It turns out, I'll tell you the story of how he became the thing, and then I'll tell you what his model is. Okay. Um, so he became the thing a decade or so later, you know, late 1970s. He has this guy. He, that well, I don't know exactly where he's from. I think he's from Rhode Island. I know he taught in Providence. I know that he, or near Providence, actually, not in Providence, in, in Rhode Island. I know that he was at one of the universities, I think BU in Boston, um, named Henry Giroux. And Henry, that's G-I-R-O-U-X. And this guy is a, just a straight up, you know, new style communist, you know, Western style communist. And he was trying to do radical education with the his students, his fairly conservative principal in Rhode Island wouldn't let him. 
He lost his mind over this. He's throwing a big fit. He's going to quit. He can't. He's, he rage quits basically teaching. But somebody had just given him a copy of Paulo Freire's book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, about a week earlier. You know, Providence or whatever, I guess, and or anti-Providence. And he goes home and he reads this thing overnight. And one night, if you read his own description of it, he has like a religious converge, conver, conversion around wow. Paulo Freire's liberation theology, posing his education model. Hmm. Comes back in, says, I now have the language to do what I want. Still doesn't get very far with his professors, but ends up leaving teaching in Rhode Island and going off to this university in Boston. You mean liberation theology? Is it kind of the, the whole Marxist idea of overthrowing your oppressors? Is that kind of the Yeah, that, that's the that? whole point of the Christian religion, as a matter of fact. Liberation theology is a Soviet construction, reconstruction of, of Catholicism okay. that uh, mostly took off in South America. And the idea was that Jesus came to liberate us from our oppressors. And so whether it's racism, whether it's colonialism or whatever, the real death on the cross was that. The true rebirth is in yourself to be reborn as a Marxist, as instead of being re, you know, regenerated through your uh, commitment to Christ. It's a complete m Marxist twist yeah. on... on uh, it's so close, but it's like Catholic not at all. theology. Yeah, yeah and it, it's generally what is sometimes referred to. The Baptists called this a social gospel. Um, okay, I don't I've know if the Catholics before. use exactly the same term as, as social gospel, but that's the idea. Is like that the point is that Jesus was the first socialist, and Jesus, yeah. you know, cared about the downtrodden. So that's where the, the whole Jesus was a socialist thing uh -huh, came that's from. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. right. And so the and so this was this. If we, if we tie all your stuff to catchphrases, then I'll, my brain will catch up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'll speak and I'll speak. In, in slogans. Yeah, I got to speak Gen Z. <laughs> you got to put the skibbity riz on this thing. Right? There you go. Yeah. Um, I know how you kids are. Cliff. I think we caught that. F R F R F R. I know. <laughs> oh my God, you guys. So, um, where was I? Oh, so. Anyways, bring the brain back. <laughs> yeah, bring the brain back. I went, I went Gen Z. It's like going stupid all of a sudden, real fast. As a Gen Xer, I can tell you, we're m much more smarter, much, yes, yes. much bigger brains, mm -hmm. better brains, better words, best words. Huge, the best. Huge, the best. Tremendous, tremendous abilities. Uh, <laughs> strong, powerful, vicious. All the ingredients you need. Uh, yeah. So, God bless Donald Trump. <laughs> we don't deserve him. Um, okay, so. Paulo, so that's liberation theology, right? right? So Paulo Freire is up to his neck in that, to the point where uh, Henry Giroux uh, has this conversion experience, and he goes to the university, and he ends up, Freire comes over and speaking, and he ends up, like, staying with Giroux, right? Like, oh, I'll put him up in my place, right? Mm -hmm. And they have this whole bonding experience, and it's like they drank whiskey and, like, moaned about how bad pe they've been treated together for, like, a weekend. It's like this crazy story he tells in his own books about how they bonded, and so this guy, it's like, this is some religious guru stuff going on here. When you read it, you're like, these guys are in a cult, right? <laughs> yeah. And so um, Drew decided that the problem was that we needed, he needed, or the world needed, lots of radical leftists in education, in tenured in education faculties, to start bringing Paulo's methods mm. and the critical methods into education. So w what Paulo Freire called what he did was he called it education for liberation. And um, Henry Giroux went around and got literally over a hundred uh, professors tenured at schools of colleges of education around North America, primarily in the U.S. with some in Canada, in order to get Paulo Freire's methods taken seriously by colleges of education. Mm. And that's what actually transformed our colleges of education. And the claim by their own historian of this turn in education, his name's Isaac Gottesman, from, formerly from Iowa State University, was that this was more or less completed by 1992. Giroux already had his hundred or so tenured by 1985 when Freire put out another book called The Politics of Education, which has, by the way, half of the book is just straight liberation theology. It's not even about education. It's about churches explicitly in this education book. But he lays out his method far more clearly than Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in, in my opinion at least, in Politics of Education, mm. which, you know, 1970, 1985, he had 15 years to kind of polish his thoughts. And here's how it works. This is what Education for Liberation, which became called Critical Pedagogy, here's how it works. Paulo Freire, borrowing from, he says Mao, but it turns out Lenin also said it, 
Uh, Lenin directly said it back, I think, actually in 1917, but it might have been 1919, not very long into his reign of power. Right. Lenin actually said that there's no literacy without political literacy. And this is the key idea. So Paulo Freire figures out that the academic material in a you know, classroom setting is actually what he calls a mediator to political knowledge. So in other words, it's an excuse to talk about politics. So you have wow. a math problem, maybe it's a word problem, and it has some word in it. It could be any word, right? It could be tree. There's trees, <laughs> right? So, you know, Billy's going to go pick oranges from the orange tree. He's going to pick 50 oranges or whatever, because, of course, they're going to be 5,000 oranges or what, you know. And they say he picks, you know, 50 oranges per tree on 10 trees or whatever, right? And you think, well, what's wrong with that, right? Billy's picking oranges, right? Well, I mean, we you think, well, maybe they'll talk about, you know, forced labor and immigrants or something. They could totally get there, right? The whole point is yeah. how do you turn that setup into a political conversation? Mm -hmm. But the idea of the tree itself, right? So now all of a sudden it's, the, it's an open door to start talking about, you know, well, why do trees produce fruit? Mm -hmm. What's the point of a tree? Is the point of a tree to feed people? Is farming really the best? And you can, this is what I'm saying is to twist it into some political conversation. Yeah. So what, and that one's kind of a dumb example, but a real example from reconstruction in a way. That's right. Yeah. It, it, it's literary criticism applied to every academic subject. And so a real example is this is a real word problem. It's a real teacher training example that I know about is Johnny's riding in the car with his mom and dad on the way to an amusement park. The amusement park is 50 miles away. They've already driven 30 miles. How far do they have to go? That's a real second grade level subtraction word problem, right? And so they focus maybe on the word word uh, on the word amusement park and say, who's been to an amusement park, guys? And some kids raise their hand and some don't. And then they shift and they stop talking about the the math and they start and they don't even talk about the amusement park. They start talking about the difference. Wow, some of you guys have been, but some of you haven't. Why would that be? And then they're taught to prime the kids wow. until somebody says something like, not everybody can afford it, my parents won't let me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so you can generate, and this is what, they, what he called it, a generative theme. You can generate a political conversation out of anything when you're trained in critical pedagogy or education for liberation. Mm -hmm. And that's what Paulo Freire said the point is. Technically speaking, we don't have to unpack this, but he said you use the generative theme to set up an abstract codification of a political circumstance that you then take the students through a decodification process so that mm. you show them the code, which could be a trees, garden, amusement park, whatever, and then you're going to deconstruct that and show them the hidden politics behind it in the decodification part so they can see the true reality, the concrete realities behind their experience. So the point is that it's an emotionally engaging or exciting or culturally relevant, <laughs> is the phrasing today, topic that they can get ex into, and then once they get into it, you can then have the desired political conversation around something that the kids are already naturally excited yep. about. And that's how they hijacked education. And like I said, you now know the story. That's the method. That method got refined, but it also was basically installed in every college of education as like the new thing to do by 92, set up on the backbones of things like what Dewey and Vygotsky and I think the other guy's name is Thompson, and, and Horace Mann had come up with and embedded into the structure of public education, even though the content couldn't shift to the either brainwashing or, or indoctrination content that we see today. So um, I'm curious, is that part of that language? Because it almost seems like how could these people have been asleep at the wheel, people who knew the truth and at the time, like, is it the language that they use that people didn't know that this was actually going on? Partly, yeah. They, yeah. Partly. So you guys have probably heard the communist term, the long march through the institutions, right. right? Okay, so that was a term coined by a guy named Rudy Deutschke in 1966, a communist. And his idea was we're going to take our ideology and march through the institutions to change society downstream from the institutions. He was modeling it after the activities of Mao Zedong. It's named after a big giant retreat Mao was forced into called the long march which was a physical long march of like, I'm serious, like 10,000 kilometers or some insane distance Whoa. that they got forced to, to march. Well, it's going to be a long march. He had to do a long march out and a long march back in, and now they're going to do a long march into the institutions, is what Rudy Deutschke said. Well, first, this was 66. They tried the direct radicalism route, all the riots and everything in 68 and 69. Detroit still hasn't recovered, um, and that didn't work. And so in 72, Herbert Marcuse, the leading leftist thinker, neo-Marxist thinker of the era, came out and he wrote a book called Counter-Revolution and Revolt. And he explicitly says in the middle that um, what needs to happen 
is that we need to go into the institutions. We need, he says, Rudy Deutschke calls it the long march of the institutions. That's what he says. He names it explicitly, and we need to do it. Mm. And so what we need to do is wow. go, he's like, if you're going to be a computer programmer, get your degree in computer programming, go work for a computer programming, and bring your ideology with you. Mm. And where he starts to say all the different things, he said, you're going to do the job, but you're going to bring your views with you mm. and infect the organization, right? And so... He said, one of the things that he says is we have to go into computer programming, we have to go into this, we have to go into that, but he says education at all levels. That's a direct quote. Wow. So we need to get into education because everything, all professional jobs are downstream from education. Right. You have to get a college degree, and the college kid, people who go to college have to get educated. And so if they can get a hold of education, they can actually kind of... What the what it's called in um, Marxist theory is social reproduction theory, or the problem of social reproduction. Societies reproduce themselves generation to generation. So we get raised in our society. We have our values, American values. We go become teachers, and we teach the kids American values. We become parents. We teach the kids American values. Or if we're in the church, you know, in that domain of our lives, we're we're teaching Christian values at home. We're taking our kids to church, and they're getting the Christian values. So society reproduces its values from one generation to the next. They decided education was the place that you could basically put a crowbar under the rock and pop right. it open, right? Mm. And Paulo Freire's method is the tool that let them slip it in and trick people. But to your question, how did they, how did they get in there? They went to college. They got credentials and they went to work and they just slowly pushed things little bit by little bit by little bit further left in a very incrementalist fashion and so they were largely under the radar like i said marcuse said ed, go into education at all levels and i mentioned goddessman their historian a moment ago the first sentence goddessman wrote a book in 2016 called the critical turn in education explaining this history that's where i got the date 1992 for the conquering of uh, colleges in, of education. Well, the first sentence of that book is, and I quote, first, not the introduction, chapter one. So people can go look it up and check me. Page one, right? First sentence on page one. Where did all the 60s radicals go? And he says, not to the religious cults and not to yuppiedom, but to the classroom. Mm. So all those radicals in the 60s who the were, teachers. they all went in, not all of them, but a very large yeah. percentage of them went into either higher education or into wow. into colleges of education, into classrooms. Uh, for example, um, Bill Ayers, the weather underground guy, became an education activist after he got done bombing things. His wife... Bernadine Dorn became a English professor, I think English, I double check me on that, at Northwestern Elite University, where she sat on the faculty until she retired, uh, you know, comfortably decades later. So the universities were just like, yeah, let the, like they were already radicalizing. So they just let all these radicals kind of come in. And a lot of them went into colleges of education. And a lot of them started to filter out first into college, but then into um, K through 12 classrooms. So was there anybody at the time when this was going on in, in the 80s or 90s that recognized it then? Like, do we have any writings oh, yeah, from them? Yeah, or yeah, is yeah. There... There were, I mean, like Henry Drew's story alone. It's like, you know, I told you he had Paulo Freire came and he's like, I'll put him up and all that. And so I don't even think he graduated from, I'd have to double check, but he had his education department at, let's assume it was BU because it could have been BC, but I'm almost positive it was BU. Um had a famously conservative dean. Pause just for a minute. Let your head spin. Because <laughs> this is in the 80s, right? An education school in Boston had a famously, viciously conservative dean. It's you know, a like, miracle. <laughs> it's not a miracle. It was normal. <laughs> yeah. And they slowly started to get these people pushed out. So these people fought back. Right. So this is why it took the subterfuge of the Paulo Freire method, and it took Giroux going around and getting 100 faculty members tenured, because then they can act as a Trojan horse to bring this right. stuff in. And this is, it's a long march. They're now wedging their departments leftward uh, by being intolerant with their ideology, bringing the leftist materials in rather than filtering them out, demanding they have a seat at the table, and so on. And um, they, the, the, the people before them, Herbert Bowles, Samuel Gintis, to a degree, Ira Shore, although he's a little later, um, Michael Apple, dedicated educational communists, and they made... I mean, Apple had really big contributions, Michael Apple did, but these guys made very little dent on changing education. It took Giroux and his critical pedagogy, as it's called, 
which is, like I said, it's a form of subterfuge. It's making it look like an engaging, interest-building right. method that you're actually using to hijack education to get under the radar. And then, like I said, the long march for the institutions isn't just bring your people in. It's when you get your people in, it starts to squeeze everybody else out. Mm. That's your what we call right. diversity and inclusion <laughs> purges today, right? You hire by diversity so that you're bringing in a higher proportion or a higher likelihood they don't necessarily screen for radicals. Right. Although your diversity statement is an ideological statement. So they can screen for radicals uh, to bring, not to keep them out, but to bring them in. And then inclusion policies say, well, you know, you disagreed with Professor X. Professor X is a woman of color. Therefore, you're a racist. And, you know, your life sucks at your university until either you leave or retire early or get pushed out. And that's the diversity inclusion. Um, wow. It, that's literally it's it's what communists call entryism. It's a tool for for bringing people in and transforming an institution from the inside. Well, and it's it's so cynical when you think about it too, because if a parent they come home and they see that this word problem is there, they're not going to know that the teacher's that's actually right. using it to indoctrinate them into Marxism. So you have all these people who don't even have kids taking over the education system, uh -huh. and you have the poor parents that don't even know anything. And people, it's like people not just who don't have kids. They also are explicitly activists, and that's why they decided to go into education, and they tell you that. I mean, the, yeah. I think one of the biggest gifts of Libs of TikTok was people explicitly saying that they went into education because they're an activist and they want to use children to change the world. And it's like, wow, okay, yeah. there you go. So you're right, and it's worse than that because the only way that you'd be able to see it if you were a parent is one of two ways. Your child comes home and reports it to you, which... I don't know if y'all y'all are young. Have you ever tried to get some information out of your kids no. about what's going on at school? It's it, You might as well be talking to the dog. Like, <laughs> you, you know what happened at school? Stuff? Like what? Math? Like, the, is that it? I don't remember. And it's like you, you can yeah. get nowhere, right? Yeah. And you see their homework, and their homework looks fine, so you don't think anything of it. Yeah. The only way you'd see it is if your, your child happens to notice something and tells you, and then you're going to have this whole, did your child fabricate it? Did your child get it wrong? Right. Is it as bad as he said, you know, are you overblowing it? You weren't there. Or you could show up and watch, at which point they just don't do it that day. And yeah. nobody has time to go watch yeah. every day. Yeah. And so that's where COVID became their weird, you know, silver lining undoing. Because mm -hmm. everybody started doing their education by iPad at home because they <laughs> yeah. closed the schools, largely as an extortion racket to get a trillion dollars from the government, which they got. Um, and... Parents could see and hear what was happening in the classroom all of a sudden right. while simultaneously noticing that their kids were like learning diddly squat, right? Like it wasn't working. No. Yeah. And so um, I've heard a lot of stories of just parents like looking over the shoulders of their kids on Zoom and be like, what are you learning? <laughs> and, like right. all of this insanity. It, it's, I mean, it's a moment. I know that you guys probably have you. I know we talked last night, so you've watched the classics. I don't know if you have yet, but like the Wizard of Oz, when you know the they're in, they're finally there at Oz. Not the spoiler alert, young people, <laughs> if you haven't watched the movie, the Wizard of Oz turns out just to be a dude, yeah. and he's hiding behind a curtain, and he has a machine that makes him look like a big scary magical thing, yeah. right? It's like a hologram machine with smoke and fog and like a big projector and fire and like pyrotechnics. It's scary and all the stupid Oz people are afraid of him mm -hmm. and then the, the Toto the little dog Dorothy's little dog gets out of her hands and scampers over bites the little emerald curtain and pulls it open and there's this guy pulling the levers like oh, I'm the great and terrible Oz and he's just this old fat guy yeah. and it, everybody's like wait it's just you and he's like Pay, he literally turns around and says, this is where the line comes from. Here's a catchphrase. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And he's trying to close the curtain. Yeah. And he's saying that into the microphone. Pay no attention to the man <laughs> behind the curtain. But that's what happened with COVID is like they closed the schools in Zoom or whatever teams or whatever program it happened to be that people were using became Toto pulling back the curtain. And parents are like, what is going on here? Yeah. And so all of a sudden, here we are in 2021 looking at a project that started in earnest in 1917, so literally a, a century, century, 104 years, and parents are finally like, wait, what? Yeah. And that's that's what happened. And, I mean, so let's blame conservatives because we love to – conservatives love to yeah. have a little bit of – we're in we're in New England. Everybody is going to, like, get their lashes and whip <laughs> themselves, we, you know, Hester Prynne or something. We all know how this works here. <laughs> And put on your your like your scarlet C for conservative. Yeah, there, there's like stocks right outside this, That's right. this building. We'll, do, we'll go strap in. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. So 
conservatives basically didn't like public education, especially after the Department of Education was created by Jimmy Carter in 79. And so they basically just let leftists run it. Hmm. And these leftists were very dedicated. They still had a hard time getting into it, but they were very diligent. They really wanted this. And so for 50 years, it's not as bad as some other domains like civil rights law. Everybody's like, civil rights law is leftist. It's like, well, you left it to leftists for 50 years and it became that way. Yeah. Um, but it's actually just due process. But <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the, the conservatives got uninvolved. Right. And, of course, leftists never stop. Yeah. If they see an opening, they're always looking for an opening. They're always going to take it. Leftists are always looking to implement their programs everywhere they can. And we, they squeezed us out of education. That was proactive on their part. But as far as, like, education policy and things go, we basically were asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. And there were problems. Like, we don't have to get we can get as conspiratorial as you want go for it <laughs> but like let's look just at this century right so y'all's lifespans roughly so in the early 2000s you have george w bush r republican right so here's what is he though right <laughs> so george w bush installs this program called no child left behind yep. which at the time all my peeps because i was an, a young adult at the time i was y'all's age uh we're all calling it no child gets ahead, right? <laughs> but the pro the point was that there was actually a massive crisis happening within education that we have again now, which is that education wasn't producing adequate results. American education was slipping. That might be partly due to infiltration of leftist ideas. It might be due to any number of factors, just disengagement, lots of things, money being unevenly spread around. So this idea was, with No Child Left Behind, was that there's now going to be a scorecard for all of your kind of academic requirements. And schools are going to get rated, literally, A, B, C, D, F. And we're going to determine where a school is. And we're going to use, you know, are they salvageable? Or are they in trouble? You know, to figure out funding. And we're going to tie all these mechanisms of funding. So the question is, well, is that good or bad, right? Well, a fundamental rule that a lot of people understand and understood at the time and understood well before that is once you start measuring something, somebody's going to game it, right? Mm. Yep. Yeah. People are always going to game the measurements because that's the shortest way to win, yeah. right? And so now you have all these measuring sticks to get money to the schools. So sometimes the schools are doing what they're supposed to do and doing the best that they can and doing the reporting and seeing where the chips fall. But sometimes they're like, we can get an extra million dollars for our district this year if we like do X, Y, Z, right? Yeah. And so the gaming thing starts to happen. And now they're recording what has come to be known as competencies, academic competencies. They're recording those to see how they go and tying that to funding. That dynamic, which was instituted with a huge campaign by George W. Bush, it wasn't like he just sat around and signed it. Yep. He pushed hard for this. Beca that measuring tool became the tool by which they were able to transform what we'll call lower education, K through 12. Um, higher education has its own slightly separate track, has to do with Bill Clinton signing uh, the, the federal underwriting of student loans, and that's a whole other story. We can tell that story maybe sometime, but it's not what we're talking about. Okay, so what happens? Well, No Child Left Behind doesn't remain No Child Left Behind. Whether it worked or not, I'm not entirely clear. Of course, the numbers got better, but were they just gaming the numbers? Right. Um, what came, but they needed some. They believed they needed an accountability program, and it was going to be managed through the failing Department of Education. Why do I call it the failing Department of Education? Is it to sound it Trumpian? <laughs> no, because it's the only department in the federal government or in any part of the U.S. government that I'm aware of that has had a consistent decline in everything it's in charge of since its implementation. It has never made a single thing better. This That's is all crazy. provable. Every yeah. single statistic has gotten worse wow. as long as it's existed. So they thought they needed accountability to make it so that, you know, you have these teachers, they're probably not doing what they're supposed to do. These principals, yeah. they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So we're going to up the standards, but right? But isn't that what government always does? They add uh -huh. a piece of government, it causes problems. Instead of taking away, taking it away, let's add more government. Maybe that'll fix the problem. Once you tie it to federal <laughs> money, and now all of a sudden you've got a game, yeah. right? right? And that game is going to get corrupted, and that game is going to get played. Even if it starts off with the best of intentions, the cronyism is going to make its way in because yeah. that's how that works. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's not, it's taxpayer money, but it's free money. Right. right. Yeah. And that's kind of the neoliberal standard, which is let's cook up a way for the government to give corporations free money, lots of taxpayer money by law. Um, 
military industrial complex. Well, here we have the education industrial complex. For sure. And um, in the 2010s, this gets kind of skyrocketed with the big dramatic fight over Common Core. Common Core, actually, a lot of people don't know where that came from. Mm. And, they, you know, it just kind of came out of nowhere. And there's these Republican governors kind of got involved. It did not come out of nowhere. It came from the United Nations. It came from a guy named Robert Mueller, not the not FBI. The, yeah, guy. I was about to be like, not what? Even spelled the same way. M U L L E R. Total, di- total. If he's like a German, totally different guy, not related. And so Robert Mueller was a UN guy, and it turns out just to be like all cards on the table, he was a New Age occultist who was deeply embedded in schools of thought that published books under, you know, publishing companies like the Lucifer Publishing Company. Good. Education books. That's good. Not kidding. It's called the Lucius Trust, L-U-C-I-S Trust. Look it up today if you want. Guess what that was funded by? Same Rockefellers and the Fords. Um, So he was big into that weird line of thought and came up with a world core curriculum so that everybody in the world would have the same not just academic material but now spiritual and and ethical values education and that was called the world core curriculum and the united states declined to adopt it as written Mm -hmm. and which obama was president so that's a little bit shocking and i I think the republicans actually blocked him on this and uh the republican governors largely cooked up their own like sideways version called common core and common core was implemented through obama's department of education in his first term um I'm trying to think of what that guy's name was. I always forget who his education was. The, what was it originally was. called? It went from what to Common Core? World Core. World Core okay. curriculum okay. to Common Core curriculum. Definitely sounds less dystopian. Yeah. <laughs> but still kind of dystopian. But it came from the United Nations, and yeah. it came out of the occult teachings of a woman named Alice Bailey, who was openly an occultist, who wrote a book called, and everybody go look this up, yeah. Education in the New Age. I encourage people to go look this up and read it. If you want to download a copy of Education in the New Age for free, you can find it on the United Nations website mm. for free. It's really weird that it's there uh, unesco's website more specifically so if you go to the unesco library and type in alice bailey you can find a lot of her stuff i'm just pointing that out to people in 2015 this gets supercharged by a passage of a bill this is now the end of obama's tenure in office this is being lobbied for by a woman who's very active in education today called linda darling hammond that's a hyphenated last name so linda's her first name darling hammond is her last names, and uh, Linda Darling Hammond is an advocate of what's called social emotional learning. Yep. Social emotional learning turns out to come from the Fetzer Institute, which is this new age occult religion institute in Kalamazoo, Michigan, that was founded by the super radio would be billionaire now, but hyper millionaire, sent a millionaire at the time, John Fetzer, who endowed his own institute with $200 million of his own money in like the 70s or something, so or 50s maybe, a lot of money, a lot of money, right? Well, the Fetzer Institute was dedicated to the teachings of Alice Bailey in the book she published from her Lucifer Publishing Company <laughs> called Education in the New Age, and social-emotional learning was born out of that, which is all really weird because the Common Core didn't work to bring this same model in so well, so now we've got the Every Student Succeeds Act lobbied for because it takes all of that um, academic competency reporting that No Child Left Behind followed by um, Common Core. Common Core was, it was whatever it was for the kids, right? And we can talk forever about how it's all this weird new math and now parents can't help their kids with their math, which puts a wedge between parents and kids. Like, that's all real. I right? remember, I was, that was me. I yeah. was alive during that time. I was in elementary yeah, school. That's right. And I remember my teachers literally told me that because my dad was, I was struggling yep. with math. And don't, don't ask your dad. Yeah, don't ask your dad because we mess teach you it a different yeah, way. we teach it a different that's way now. old way of doing it. That was it. a 100% that's move crazy. to split, yeah. par- that's to get parents uninvolved so the parents weren't looking at the education so they didn't see it. They couldn't wow. see the brainwashing until the it COVID until they came home Zoom calls. Thanksgiving, yeah. <laughs> they could, the COVID Zoom calls were what? So it's 20 years, yeah, or 15 years of that. Well, anyway, you have all of this Common Core reporting that's piled on top of the No Child Left Behind reporting, and the Every Student Succeeds Act requires now that you report not just on academic what they've now started to call competencies, not mastery anymore, competencies uh, like merit badges. But now you have to report on some non-academic competencies. And so this organization called the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, which was partly headed by this Linda Darling-Hammond, who was 
also on both the Obama and Biden education transition teams that she was lobbying for, went around and said, wow, you've got this new check mark, checkbox you have to put off for non-academic competencies in your, in your education to get federal money. We've got a program. It's called social emotional learning. And if you just implement the castle, you know, five prong method, the castle five, they call it, and you can check off how they're working on their self-awareness, social awareness, um, self-management, relationship skills, responsible decision making, these, you know, core competency groups. And you can get your check marks, so therefore you can get your federal money. Because all this, every, I don't know if you guys, you were kids, so you probably didn't hear from teachers about what they thought of Common Core in like 2012-ish, you know, what they thought about Common Core was. I have so much damn paperwork now, yeah. it's killing me. That's all I ever heard from teachers was how much paperwork they had. Well, SEL, sold Social Emotional Learning, or CASEL, sold itself as a way to... This now paperwork has just expanded into a whole new domain that's literally the practice of psychology without a license on children in an untherapeutic, non-controlled environment, which should be a felony. And all of a sudden, they're like, how are we going to check off these non-academic competency boxes? Mental health, social interaction, blah, blah, blah. And the answer turned out to be, Castle has a framework. And so they made it really easy to do all that paperwork, so everybody adopted it. Wow. And it turns out it's based on the same weird occult stuff, which... You say, well, what does that have to do with Marxism? Marxism has the exact same goal, which is to remake man into the thing that he was intended to be through what they called, you know, the immortal science of Marxism, but what Alice Bailey called the science of right human relations. I mean, it's the same damn religion. It's two denominations of the same religion. It's not even as far apart as Catholics and Protestants are both Christian. Two, it's, it's like two varieties of Baptists of New Age is Marxism and this stuff. And... You can see how the administrative apparatus, though, made it have to happen, yeah. Yeah. tying it to huge amounts of money, which is constantly, once the school gives you money, by the way, we could get into the whole conspiracy theory about school lunches. Once the, school start, <laughs> once the government starts paying for something, it becomes a tool. Because right. then what happens? Well, you all have to do this, or we're going to take your school, school lunch money away. Yeah. And then what they'll say is our political opponents want the school lunch money to get taken away from these schools because they don't want poor kids to eat. And all of a sudden they have a political winner and can do whatever they want. This is how they That's actually took over. That's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I ran for school board in my town last year. Based. And <laughs> social emotional learning. It's everything. That's all they, all they talked about. I remember what was that question they asked me about? It was like three things tied together. They tried to tie um, sex ed, social emotional learning, and cyber safety. Sounds like, right. Yeah, that all sounds together right. Together in a question, and I was like, I have never. Well, that's because heard this before the, the sex ed stuff comes from a partnership between three organizations, which are Planned Parenthood, or actually IPPF, the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Yeah. Uh, so it's international mega arm, and then in the the German version of this is called the Guttmacher Institute, which basically I think my German's not good, but I think it means good maker, or something like that. The Guttmacher Institute, and then the third one's UNESCO which also developed in conjunction with IPPF and Guttmacher what's called comprehensive sexuality education. But UNESCO is where the Common Core came from. It's mm. like the same people doing yeah. the same stuff. So, yeah. of course, yeah. So with the, the UN, they released something talking about how about changing the age of consent laws or something like this. Is that tied into that in any yeah, way? it's called sexual citizenship. It's one of the seven pillars of comprehensive sexuality education. Oh, my gosh. That's wild. Dude, so that everything is woven so together. He, here's the Trojan horse on that. It is. But let me, this is just so sick. So when I was a kid, so this is before your time, we had this whole controversy about whether or not – I was in Tennessee, so it's conservative. But it was like, are we going to have sex ed, right? And so – there's this fight, and a lot, a lot of the kids, their parents wouldn't let them have it at school, but we had, starting in sixth grade, we weren't allowed to have it before sixth grade, so that's like 11 years old. Um, it was like real anatomical, real basic. The, looking back on it, there were some like weird things mm -hmm. that we did that I think were like in the wrong direction, in the kind of implanting thoughts direction. Like, yeah. For sure. I'll, I'll go into that in a minute with the surveying of SEL, if I remember. Remind me to tell, talk about that. But it was real basic anat anatomical, right? So then in 2003, so just for reference, I graduated high school in 97. So we can go back. It was like 92 or something when I was in sixth grade, 91, something like that. So um, nine, 2003 is much later. Right. I would finish my master's degree in 2003. So I'm out of the public schools. That's when the United Nations and Planned Parenthood cooked up 
comprehensive sexuality education. Well, the first pillar of that is like sexual health or, or anatomy or whatever. Like two or three of the pillars are the things that you would expect. Anatomy, safe sex, you know, birth control options or whatever. Um, of course, certain people get all worked up about that, but it could be very like basic. Yeah. But the anatomy, diseases and birth control, like the disease prevention is the least objectionable part about it right yep. people are like wait well maybe right and it, so it gets embedded in health classes and all of that and an anatomy that would be in like the like the basic a reproductive anatomy probably like it'd be actually kind of nice if they taught basic reproductive anatomy right now and people could see oh shit, there's boys and girls <laughs> like there's just easy. two <laughs> wow <laughs> but Planned Parenthood came up with We'll say that there were three. I don't remember what all seven of their pillars are. We'll say that three of them are the old sex ed stuff. Maybe it's just two. And now there are seven. So they added in some others. And some of them are less objectionable than others. But two of them, numbers three and four on their typical list, number three is called sexual citizenship, mm -hmm. which they has a variety of definitions. The primary definition is the right and the power to say yes to sex that you want and to say no to sex that you don't want. That's sexual citizenship. But it also has to do with, like, let's say that you're gay and you feel like you don't have as many or that you're some kind of a deviant. Like, maybe you want to wear, like, fetish gear to a pride thing or whatever. And you feel like you can't be your full sexual self in public or whatever. <laughs> well, you're not a full citizen because you can't be your full self. You can't bring your whole self to the street or whatever or to work. And so that that's another meaning of sexual citizenship that they, that they talk about. That, of course, is a huge mess. Well, then that's... Pillar number three. Pillar number four is the one I really wanted to scare you with because it grossed you out with because it's actually called pleasure-based sex education. And it's everything you think it is. So I don't, I don't have to where, elaborate. When all the parents are in the school board meetings, like reading off like the all of basically the directions of what you just said, that's that's where all this comes where from. Where you're seeing instruction as low as in, you know, single digit ages, you know, elementary school ages, teaching them things that like masturbation feels good, that's pleasure-based sex education. And so, I mean, it's a real question because we know that their slope is slippery and it's like deliberately like, it's not even slippery. They're like, somebody's out there like greasing it, right? Yeah. <laughs> On purpose to make you slide down it faster. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. And it's like it, the, the slope is lubed to be a little bit edgy with how we phrase it. And In context, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's what they're doing. Like, what would they use, right? <laughs> the, the Kentucky jelly, of course. And so they are... The question is how long with with the drag queen story hour for example how long does it until you have like they're not going to bring in strippers because that would reify like women how long before they start bringing sex workers in to give lectures and or demonstrations mm. how long before they start lobbying at certain levels to make it participatory yeah mm. you know i don't yep. know that that's Only going to happen but so, I, there, I can't yeah. see what would stop them from going there other than you know a bunch of normal people saying based whoa dad's going into school yeah, and being well, like stay away from, <laughs> staying away from my kids that's right so yeah. you said something about sexual citizenship in the in the third pillar was it something you said um you're less of a sexual citizen or whatever if you're not living out your full every sexual fetish every sexual have. fetish that is like so they want they're encouraging people to be more sexually deviant and more public about it is the that idea, what it is? More public about it in yeah. particular, not necessarily more deviant. Um, what they would do is try well, to like... It's just a natural result. Yeah, they would try to like yeah. lure you into that, right? So this is the implanting ideas thing the, with kids in particular. Social emotional learning uses a lot of surveys because they're always having to assess. There are reasons that they're doing this. So, so I think there are a couple main like cynical reasons. One is that they're doing a massive data mining operation on the kids. They're using it to build out gigantic psychometric profiles. It sounds like they're building a social credit system because they are around the children and actually figuring out how to build edu educational software that is actually algorithmically attuned to their psychological preferences, a.k.a. a perfect brainwashing machine, because they are. But they also use these survey data to go and say, wow, look, you know, one of the questions on the survey might be how many time, how many days a week do you feel sad? Right. And so you got like dramatic 12 year old girls putting like six. Always. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Always. And so what happens with that? Well, now they say, look at this There's a depression crisis in our school. And so we need more social emotional learning and more money for mental health in the schools. Right. So that's a grift. And that's a real thing. I've called that the social emotional wa uh, learning water wheel. Yeah. It's, they just keep the wheel turning to keep yeah. they they use the social emotional learning to gather the data. They use the data to say we need more social emotional learning. Okay. Uh, and so that's a thing that they're doing. But they also use this to implant ideas, that the, the, the generative theme model, to put this idea in a kid's head. So some of the questions on the surveys are like, 
how many sex so, so imagine this is for like a, a 10 11 year old right maybe even sometimes younger but this is usually like that crossover into middle school junior high so 11 12 maybe some of the questions in the story are how many sexual partners have you had and it's like zero, one, two. In some of the surveys, I've seen one. I need to find it so I have it as like a source I can actually like prove that I've seen it. Say more than 20. Wow. And so what that does, you're, you're 11, you're 12. You very likely have no sexual experience whatsoever except whatever you maybe have seen on the internet. It's often this mystique. It's this thing that you've not done, you're not doing. You're just kind of awakening to it as puberty might be beginning for some people, but not everybody. And then you're like, Asking yourself, is that normal? Is it normal that an 11 year old would have had? There might be people in my class who've had 20 plus. My gosh, yeah. And this is why I said. I remember, that, I have flashbacks now. I remember all these surveys that I took now. There was a 40, 50 something year old nurse asking me these questions. And, they, and part of the questions would also be now, this is actually crazy that I'm remembering this and it all ties back. And they would also be like, Something like, how comfortable are you a talking about your parents with these things? Yeah, that's right. That's part of the, exactly. the questioning. No, totally. And it's like... I used to get these surveys at the doctor's offices. Every year going, to get, going for a physical. The problem is, is when you present this information to an innocent child, you're planting the idea oh, yeah. in their head at the same time yeah. as you're gathering information. For sure. So you're doing two things. So my experience back in 92, let's say, one something sixth grade was in fact we had like the 56 year old scary nurse this woman came in like she was scary oh, yeah. and she came in and she was like i'm just going to tell you i really like sex and all of us were like Ugh, gross <laughs> oh. you know and it was like we're like never having it okay and so um maybe we need that to one of the things that we did kids. we didn't have surveys <laughs> but they had us all go out of the room this is in 90 91 right yeah. a long time ago this is way before planned parenthood and UNESCO cooked up their crap and we had to go out and we had a box and they had a bunch of different like beads like you know you make like a bead bracelet or yeah. whatever of different colors and they were like you know uh blue green yellow orange red purple or whatever right and the scale was you know that blue meant you hadn't had sex at all green was one like you'd kissed somebody and it was like up the scale till you know the last one was like either purple or black meant that you'd had multiple actual sex partners, right? And so we were anonymously, one at a time, sent out to go put it in the box, and then they put up how many beads of each kind there were. And so this is a bunch of sixth graders, right? And so it was like, crazy. it was Challenge, exactly yeah. what you would expect. It was like almost all blue and green. Like a couple people had gone on a date and like kissed somebody or something. It was exactly what you'd expect. And then a huge spike on like the last one, right? Mm -hmm. Where every punk kid went and just threw a bunch of black ones in there because nobody was watching them. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that same thing though, like that black bead is all, uh, looking back, I never would have thought of it at the time. And that's the thing, kids don't think it's weird that they're filling out these surveys or whatever. Yeah. Looking back at it, it's like, that's sort of the same idea because I do remember wondering, wow, you know, like a bunch of my classmates put red beads in there, which means that they've, you know, actually had sex at 11 years old. Mm. Like I haven't. It's like a perversion I, of like- I? The purity ring almost. That's right. It's a, literally a perversion of the purity ring in reverse. Well, it's a deliberate destruction of the idea of childhood innocence, yeah. which is throughout the queer theory literature and education as a deliberate objective that they have, which is to overcome childhood innocence, which they see as a illegitimate narrative used to prop up privilege. Some kids have it and other kids don't. You get mm. the whole thing. Wow. It's like othering. Almost. Yeah, they it's say the childhood innocence though. in the long run straightens out kids. It's a, it's like a conspiracy that straight people have to straighten out kids <laughs> so that they don't grow up to be queer activists. And I'm not joking. That's actually, wow. the, the woman I'm uh, paraphrasing here is Hannah Dyer. You can look her up. She's real. She has this actual paper about what's called queer futurity, and that's what she talks about. That's crazy. So this is bad. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> yeah. but so, no, but it's, yeah. but so it's okay. So that's the, whole, yeah. it is bad, but... It's like finding out you have cancer. In 2020, the parents saw behind the curtain. We had the Wizard of Oz. Now we're now we're in an oncologist's office, and a lot of people think it's you got bad news when you find out you have cancer. That's true. The news wasn't so good, but it's not true if you shift your perspective in a real way. Right. You already had cancer if you got diagnosed with cancer, right? So now you are in a position where you know what's going on and you can actually begin treatment, whereas before you were actually just deteriorating and didn't know. So we have the, it's that silver lining exactly. good news, right? It's not, it's still a storm cloud, but 
there's a silver lining, and the silver lining is we now know that this is all happening in our schools. We know that it's tied back through UNESCO and Planned Parenthood is tied in with them and that's how they have so much influence. We know that their inspiration, we know what what policies made it possible. We know which which measurements that they use at the schools in order to, in, in the, the money. We actually know a lot about how it works. We know that it was heavily funded and subsidized by entities that have shady histories and everything like the Rockefellers, Fords, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through $300 million at, at Common Core and almost $1.7, $1.8 billion at social emotional learning so far by the way, so that we know that these guys are really investing. We know a lot about this now, yeah. right? We know how it works. We know that it works. In other words, we can sit back and assess this cancer and decide how it can be treated. Mm. How can it be treated? Well, I mean, it's very obvious that these tying these different measurements, like right now we're trying a very blunt instrument, at least in conservative states, which is to ban this stuff. Iowa has tried to ban social emotional learning from their state department of education. And for example, and um, it's a blunt instrument. Yeah. Uh, but what we're we're learning, like Florida's using some some much more kind of adventurous approaches. You have uh, disruptions to the accreditation pipeline. They're they're making it so you can get alternative paths to their accreditation. They are. Oh my gosh! I just went through this the other day. I'm trying to remember everything Florida's doing. They've got some really clever stuff. They're doing stuff with the teachers unions to where they can like right now most of the time in the teachers unions, which are pushing all of this super stuff super hard. They were the ones that lobbied for the government to stay closed to get the trillion dollars that's built into more social emotional learning, by the way, um, out of COVID. Well, one of the things is that in most states, if you're a teacher, your teacher's union dues, when you're signing up and you don't really think about it, you're just signing up, you can put a check mark or an initial in a box and now out of your salary goes your teacher's union dues and you never see it, right? So you don't even know, it's like your. It's like when your taxes are withheld, you don't really know, you can look at the number, but it doesn't feel real yep. that you pay. It's not the same as like showing up to the courthouse and having to give them a check for $1,000 yep. or mail into the IRS a check for $1,000. So you don't feel it the same way. Well, Florida changed that to where that's not how that works anymore. And so, um, and there was a big Supreme Court decision that's called the Janus case. I had dinner with Mr. Janus the other day, like literally like a little over a week ago and um, talked to him and they sued to make it so that you cannot be required to join the teachers unions. Mm -hmm. And so now Florida also added a provision. I know this is this is technical weedy stuff, yeah. but they also added a provision that if, so now people are not not just getting enrolled and re-enrolled automatically into the yeah. union. They also, it turns out the unions are one of the few kind of associations that gets state certification that got state certification and they get it once and then they're certified basically forever unless mm. they do something bad enough to get decertified well now florida changed it to where you have to have over 65 percent enrollment or else you have to reapply for certification because maybe you're irrelevant so they took away the automatic individual enrollment and said that they might have to recertify if they can't keep their enrollment up and that has the combined effect of A, threatening the teachers union to maybe be decertified and lose its power in the state of Florida, which could be replicated in any state. But it also has, and I know this is really weedy for probably your podcast, but it also has the effect of moderating them because then they have to keep more conservative teachers in the union to keep their numbers high enough to not lose mm. their certification. So the teachers union gets forced to moderate and is in a, under constant threat of maybe not existing anymore and losing all of its power. Wow. So there are like technical things. Yep. We could have smart lawmakers dissect the Every Student Succeeds Act or the bills that, in, that authorized Common Core or that authorized... Um, the no child left behind and start rethinking this idea of tying measurements to federal funding mm. in fact maybe we should get out of the federal funding of education game entirely yeah, yeah. right so just cut that off at its source that's well, that a solution. would be that would be the department of education right what right. would like because so that's, a, that's two, a popular thing in the conservative movement there's two to talk solutions about with getting the, rid of the right. department of education so i think reform of the of the department of ed is impossible Okay. Like, I don't get think rid of it. Can, well, it's the only. It's I think you have to. Literally, the only entity that's only had negative outcomes. Yeah. Like, I could crap on government all day long, but at least yeah. the other ones have some net positives, right? Yeah. They have a few points on the scoreboard. DOE, all negative, <laughs> like <laughs> all the way yeah. down. I guess it's it's DO Ed or something like yeah. that. We don't want to get confused with that. I think principally, education should be bottom up, not top down. So there are two solutions. One is that you get rid of it entirely. And the other is that you get rid of all measurements mm -hmm. or you get rid of all um, 
accountability measurements, I should say. So the Department of Education, we could decide as a society, for example, to say, you know what, no, the federal government, the U.S. federal government should be funding education for all Americans. It's an American's best interest. So how are we going to do it? Simple, population. And maybe by block grant by state. So California has, you know, 40 million residents. Texas has 25 million. I'm making up numbers. I don't know yep. their actual populations. So, you know, the equivalent of, you know, prorate it by population. So California gets X dollars per child. Texas gets X dollars per child. And it's just how many school-aged children that are enrolled in the schools live in that state. And that's how what, whatever the pot is, the federal pot, gets divvied up according to that. Mm. Would, right? That's called a block grant giving insti uh, institution. Or you can just get rid of the damn thing. Gotcha. But either way, yeah. what well, you're doing is you're taking the accountability strings out. Yeah. Right, the, that accountability mechanism. So the money doesn't go to the school; it goes to the child. Is that what you're saying? The money would probably go to the state, okay. actually, and then the states, per the Tenth Amendment, would decide how they want to organize their own educational uh, program. Yeah, I don't like the idea. Period of the government giving. First of all, they're not giving children; they're giving parents money. But this is yeah. just socialist wealth redistribution, as it is. Yeah, I don't like the idea of the government creating a mechanism for giving people money because there are no ways that that's going to be left unaccountable mm -hmm. or else you're going to literally have somebody buying Twinkies and meth with the money that they're getting yeah. supposed to be for education. So there's got to be some accountability. Yeah. Sure. And once you have accountability, you have these measurements and now you're right back into the, the circle. So I am one of the very few people in the so-called conservative space that talks about education that is not pro school choice. I'm, I'm anti school choice, anti school, choice. anti school choice. It's a neoliberal policy. It's how do you get the government to give large corporations lots of money Really? It's taxpayer money going to the corporations that are going to satisfy the, the need. It is the military-industrial complex for education hmm. at a tune of $1 to $2 trillion a year of taxpayer money, which will largely go to a small number of corporations that end up cornering 75 to 80 percent of the education so market. Do you disagree years. with the part where the state get, like uh, assigns a certain amount of money? Like Part of school choice that goes into that, not only can you decide where your kids go, whether you're homeschooled, private school, or any public school in the area, but you can no, 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 money okay is that. allocated. That's called open enrollment. I'm actually okay, so, I, I like the idea that you can send your kid basically anywhere. I, I thought um, that's what school choice okay. was. Is that? But I think I mean just to uh, back into the weeds um, of this. Like if you decide to send your kid to some school that's pretty far away, that school's not obligated to send a school bus to your house or whatever, yeah. right? So like if you decide, it's like you could be zoned for this is where the school buses will come pick a school and then outside of that if yeah, you want to take your kid somewhere else you've got to take your kid somewhere else yeah or to you know a designated bus station area where they pick them up or whatever something but that's all that's weedy we don't have to get into these weeds but uh the open enrollment idea actually i'm okay with i think that you should not be trapped in a failing school or a failing school district but on the other hand I want as little government oversight of how education money is being spent as humanly possible. So the part you disagree with is the government give allocating money to either the state or to the parents to then give to, to then pay. I'm for okay the with it allocating, like I said, block grants. If it's the federal government allocating block grant money to the state, say the state of, but not directly to the parents. And then the well, then the state is going to decide how it's going to organize education for its own state because that's right. that is that's the Tenth Amendment. Yep. That's states' yeah. rights. That I think that education should be primarily operated at the state level. I agree. And if the federal government wants to throw money at it, the money should be based on a completely neutral measurement like population. Mm. Um, the upside of school choice, of course, is that it completely disrupts the teachers' unions yeah. enormously. <laughs> The downside is that it's not a conservative policy. It's a neoliberal policy. So everything you don't like about how Walmart pushed every business out of every community, especially across the South, is going to happen in education over the next decade if that's fully opened on a subsidized market, which means an inflating market. Inflation will happen where there's a subsidy. It always happens. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The government's giving you, say, $7,000 per kid. The schools are now private institutions that know you're getting $7,000 per kid. Right. So they're incentivized. They know you have $7,000. They know you also have other money. So they're incentivized to make sure that they charge you more than the $7,000. That's true. Yeah. True. So that's an inflation in that market. Subsidies always do this. So I don't want the government subsidizing. That, that said, I didn't realize that was a part of school a choice. not a conservative policy. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't that's sound right. conservative. It is a neoliberal yeah. policy. It's, um, it's how do you funnel taxpayer money to... Eventually, not immediately, but eventually large corporations that take over the majority of the market share. Would you be okay with if it was like an incrementalist sort of uh, mindset? We were like, all right, we'll do this now and then we'll work, you know, yeah, step by I step. Yeah, I mean, the, the hard part is once you get 
money like that, like it's going to have to give be it a, up. Yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. To, it's sure. very hard true. to take no, somebody's subsidy true. away. Yeah. And it's very, very hard to um, walk back programs like that. And again, that's in a sense growing the size of government. It's virtually impossible to not, to, it's virtually, yeah, that's right. It's virtually impossible not to have accountability. And once you have accountability, all you need is a wrong administration and it sprawls. Yeah. Mm. And this is actually like a fight in Arizona. Again, we're getting into weeds. But in Arizona, all of a sudden, you know, Katie Hobbs gets elected, will hesitate with that word, <laughs> becomes governor through some mechanism. And so now you have a Democrat in office and they just passed um, school choice right before Ducey left office. Was it Ducey? Is that I have the right name? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Right before he left office, they put in school choice. Everybody's at the, it's the best model in the country and it legitimately is the best model in the country as far as I'm aware. Um, and all these people started to get scared after Hobbs becomes a governor. They said, well, what is going to happen? Because there's provisions in there that could be turned to tyranny, like that any educational institution that's taken state money, even a dime of it, can be inspected by state inspectors. So if you're homeschooling and you decide to take a dime of state money, now your house can be inspected, right? So this is a fear that people right. have. Yeah. This yeah. is real. Sure. And so they say, well, what is it? And the, the, the Republican government replied to them to, the, to reassure the constituents that as long as the legislature stays conservative, there's no problem. <laughs> That's but they're three seats away from that not being the case. Yeah. So the... Like that's not smart. You yeah. all, no, I mean, the the kind of American principle has always been that when you empower the government, you have to imagine your enemies using the power that you gave yeah. the government. Yeah, not exactly. You yes. or your friends. It's not best case scenario. That's yeah. right. It's that your mortal rails. enemy will get this power too yeah. eventually. Yeah. And you're not going to be able to box them out. So again, <laughs> I get pretty pretty sketch on that. Imagine if they just didn't tax people the amount of schools that they pay in taxes already, and then people could just pay for their own education, right? But that's when you're going to figure out that most people actually are receiving a large amount of money. They're actually paying in way less than, than they get, than they get yeah. back, and which means it's a wealth redistribution program by the government. So the reply to that is, well, what about the poor kids who can't afford it? And you're like, oh, it's a socialist program. Yeah, we have a word for that. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's fine. If you want to talk about a social insurance program for poor people in schooling, that's fine. That's fine. We have lots of social insurance programs. That's yeah. a discussion to as have. Local as but possible. let's talk about what it really is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So just to, to close up, what can the average person, because a big thing running for school committee, those or school, it's called school committee here, school board. What can someone like that who wants to run for a school board and try to change their, their town, what can they actually do to combat social emotional learning and, and these these well, different things i'll give you since we're in massachusetts i will give you some bad news okay you're signing up for a hard fight <laughs> and you're outnumbered and it's not going to be easy and you have to stop you have to change your mindset the left did this 50 years ago and 30 years ago very successfully and they had the right mindset and that's why it worked they didn't go in thinking that they were going to have huge policy wins. They thought that they were going to go in there and nudge the organization in a better direction and get in the way of policies they didn't like. That's sometimes called pouring sand in the gears or pouring sand in the machine. So your job is going to be, first of all, you've got, if you're going to do this, thank you, but you need to get educated. You need to know what's really going on right. in the schools, how it actually works, and what you can do you know, why it's happening. You've got to actually know what's happening. You can't just go be, I'm a good person and I want to help. It's not enough. You've got to get educated. And then when you go in, depending on where you are, like if you're in Florida, you can probably do a lot of good now. Yeah. If you're in Massachusetts, you've got a different fight. You kind of just have to be a It's problem. not a harder fight. It's a different fight. Yeah. Your sure. job is to ask impertinent questions and to challenge, uh, you know, when they just say, we're all going to move forward on this inclusion policy. It's time to start asking questions. What does inclusion mean? Why are we doing this? Does this benefit everybody? What's going to happen to so-and-so? Somebody's going to ask those questions. Yeah. To invite people, if you have the capacity on school committee, if you have the capacity to, like I, this happened to me in, in California, I get invited out to speak at an Orange County school board meeting. So in some states at least, I don't know the laws and in, in, in the regulations in Massachusetts, but let's say that you're a conservative and you get on the school committee, you can bring in favored speakers to come in and maybe read the graphic novels, the very graphic graphic novels, or to talk on these issues, or to lobby the um, 
to lobby the the school board itself to start rethinking this, which all becomes a matter of public record. You don't want to go in thinking that this is the frustration. It seems extremely obvious to every well-adjusted adult that you don't want pornography handed out in the library to children, or you don't want drag queens performing in front. It's just, yeah, we don't want pleasure-based sex ed in kindergarten. Like, we just don't want that, right? Yeah. And we don't even have to get into the, not even, but the controversial stuff like gender, right? We don't have to get into the whole gender bread stuff. Like, we can, the real basic stuff, it's very, everybody th- agrees on it. So you think, well, we're just going to go tell them that this is happening, and then, then they're going to stop. Mindset shift. The people doing this want this to happen, they so they're know. not going to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And so your job is just to be a pain in their ass, basically. Pretty good. Awesome. What a way to end it. Be a pain in the ass. I love it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Dr. James Lindsay. I appreciate it. Uh, and we're going to have a great event tonight. I can't wait right. for this. So, sweet. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah.